Welcome back, Walter. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Dan, right. Nice to see you. Likewise, likewise. It's uh, early in the morning here, but it's always a good time. And uh, number three, number three coming up. You've been uh, yeah holding holding back this whole time so you could finally tell people what's really going on about the... Uh, well, really actually, no, not, not so much holding back, but yeah, actually, I wanted to bring it all together now, looking at the yeah. whole soil microbial ecology and that basis of agency rather than here's the problems, right? Here's actually how nature... The, the instrument, the agency nature has to use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, we'll let you uh, just jump into it and we'll reconvene in an hour or so for questions. Yeah, and, and basically this time we'll have hopefully a bit more time for questions, and but certainly like pulling the three threads together, right? Beautiful. So we can span the whole, whole <laughs> canopy. Oh, damn it. And of course, um, things have changed. I mean, I mean, obviously, as we've gone along, there's actually new developments and issues and stuff like that. So any any questions at all, we'd be yeah, happy to try and answer. Beautiful. Well, we'll let you go through the presentation first and then we'll and then we'll uh, reconvene for the. the yeah. Day. OK, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Good. And so, yeah, let us know when you're ready to go and then. Um, fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to turn my computer off, my, my, my camera off and then you're, you're, you got it. Right. OK, just say go. Go. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Uh, well, look, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, this is the third of three seminars that we've been giving in this whole program, looking at weaving science and wisdom together and to basically say, how do we take that science? How do we take that wisdom and actually get insights into what we have to do in the future? The first uh, seminar was very much looking at basically the earth soil carbon sponge and how that was critical to rebuilding hydrology and thereby naturally cooling the planet. How does this give us agency to actually naturally cool the planet? So that's what we looked at in the first session in March. We followed that up in the second session where we were looking at the nutritional integrity of our food. You know, what were the actual unique processes that allowed nature and plants to select nutrients from the soil intelligently and provide the nutritional integrity in their, our food that we need, need fundamentally for our preventative health. But this time I wanted to actually not sort of talk about problems so much, but really sort of come back to the basis of agency. You know, what is it that nature used to actually solve these problems? And so the, this one, I want to talk about more than managing the microbial ecologies uh, to regenerate the earth, yes, soils, hydrology, climate, biosystems, and our future. Okay, so it's really the agency, the tools that nature used to actually create this uh, special place that we live on. And basically get that understanding across that, you know, it's actually these biosystems that nature created, which are the foundations of our very future. We depend on them, our economy, our health, everything depends on these biosystems and these biosystems in turn depend and were created through this microbial ecology. So it's really bringing those microbes right back into the picture because we're now facing as we all agree, some fundamental challenges. Basically, if it's climate, you know, what's going to happen there, these climate extremes, the wildfires you're experiencing in California now, the floods in New York. So here, these climate extremes, they're going to intensify. And so what have we got? Not just looking at the events and the symptoms and the consequences, but going right back to, okay, how do we understand these systems and prevent them? Same, of course, in our food and nutrition. How do we actually get back to having healthy food? Because healthy food comes from healthy soils and is fundamental for keeping people healthy. We've also got the situation now of diseases. And, of course, disease is a classic expression of microbial ecology. We've had this agent now, COVID 
that has basically stepped out of its normal common cold situation, creating an enormous uh, crisis economically, socially, health-wise around the planet. And again, what's the microbial ecology and what does it teach us? And again, here is this agent impact, Angus, so what can we do about it? It really starts right back at the beginning, and we've got to make this statement that the Earth is unique, but it's unique not because of its physics or chemistry or its place in the universe, but the Earth is unique because of life. And it really comes to the fundamental process of what is life, you see? And life is actually very, very simple. And I'm going to turn the screen around now to show you a, a, a picture. Can you see that? Uh, can you I'm going to go back a bit? Can you see this picture? Yes, we can. Right. And what it's sort of showing us is in a sense, this is what in a sense is unique about life and how life evolved. Because about 3.8 billion years ago, basically, you know, in the oceans and round, we understand a hypothermal vent, a volcanic vent in the ocean, we had micro droplets of liquid, just micro droplets of seawater surrounded by an oil film. And that's how, in a sense, life started. But it was that oil film, that membrane or proto membrane around the oil film that allowed that micro uh, cell that micro droplet to in a sense absorb nutrients that it needed across the membrane and concentrate those nutrients so as i've shown here we it was 20 parts per million inside we might have 200 parts per million so it was able to concentrate nutrients across, across this, this this oil film proto membrane just for one second walter the yep. the camera is a little bit skewed to the left if you move it to the right a little bit we can see the nope other way other way yeah keep going right further okay i think now we can see the whole slide yeah okay, the, basically so the right the right side and the bottom are, are difficult to see okay okay right okay and it was able to concentrate these nutrients but at the same time it was also able to exclude toxic nutrients Okay, toxic elements such as aluminium and what have you that might be in that soil solution outside or in that seawater outside, and it was able to concentrate it. And so this process of selective concentration and exclusion enabled the inside of this droplet to have completely different chemical composition and therefore different biochemistry compared to the liquid outside. And so that was the basis of biochemistry, but then something much more profound happened. Not only did we have a different nutritional concentration inside, but we created a completely different bioenergetics because the electrical potential, it's a simple physics of a system is governed by the charge difference between the inside and the outside in this case, over the distance. And so we have in a sense this vast difference in charge properties, 200 to 20 outside, but it's over very, very small difference, just literally nanometers of membrane difference. And so you end up with a very, very high electrical potential across that membrane. And of course that is the energetics that allowed that biochemistry and life to start. So really life is as simple as a membrane bound organism or membrane, membrane bound drop of liquid with these different chemical properties and because of that, it's different electrical potential. And in a sense, that was the first cell 3.8 billion years ago, the first living cell. And of course, it's that cell that has grown and divided since then. And it has only had to have happened once. Now I'll swing back across to where I am. Can you see me now? Yes, we can see you now. Yeah, okay, good, okay. So that only had to have happened once. And that then created 
in a sense, the first living cell. And really all of life and all of our biosystem has evolved from that event because it's that life, that microbial life that now has sort of gone on to actually create everything around us. Okay, quite profoundly. This was 3.8 billion years ago, but about 3.5 billion years ago, those living cells then developed another capacity. Instead of just relying on the energy from the chemicals, it was able to take energy from the sun as photosynthesis or via photosynthesis. So it was able to basically take carbon dioxide from the air, water from the air, and through photosynthesis, through that solar absorption, convert that into carbohydrate, into sugars, with oxygen as a waste product. And so, again, this living cell was able to massively increase its energetics by using solar energy. But it's actually the oxygen, the waste product that it produced in that photosynthetic reaction that gave it the next step because that oxygen then very quickly enabled it to oxidize uh, minerals and um, chemicals. And so whereas before we had reduced compounds, uh, things like rocks and uh, chemicals in the environment, it's the oxygen that turned it into carbonates, silicates and iron oxides. And so it then actually created these minerals, silicates, carbonates, iron oxides, which then basically created the land. Most of the land is made up of actually these lighter rocks, you know, the granites, and they're floating on the heavier rocks, which are the core of the earth. And it's actually the land that was created then through this microbial action. It was like a microbial scum floating on the heavier rocks, and then they actually form the planet. So even our soils, even the mineral mineralogy of this planet is governed by these microbes or was initiated by these microbes. The oxygen from these microbes then also actually totally changed the atmosphere. Whereas the atmosphere had initially been methane and ammonia, a toxic concentration in the atmosphere, it was the oxygen that turned that methane into CO2 and water. It was the oxygen in the atmosphere that turned the ammonia into nitrogen gas and water. And so now we have an atmosphere which is basically 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then trace amounts of smaller gases, carbon dioxide at 400 parts per million, Night, uh, methane now at 700 parts per billion. So it's radically changed the composition of the oxygen, uh, co composition of the atmosphere, all through this oxidation process. And so basically life, this microbial life was now fundamental in also creating the atmosphere we were in. As the oxygen level rose, then in a sense, life was able to evolve further because rather than being very simple cells as we've described, prokaryotic cells, they were able to symbiotically fuse together to create ever more bigger and complex structures. And it's these eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells that then make up most of our life today, the higher life today. And by about 1 billion years ago, these cells, these eukaryotic cells were able to, because of the oxygen, were able to even get bigger still and create multicellular organisms. So we had the first multicellular organisms in the ocean because there was enough oxygen to go around. And then we had that explosion of life in the oceans uh, from about 600 million years ago. But very quickly, that explosion of life dominated 
the oceans, dominated all the nutrients that were available, and actually it set up another concept, competition. You see, because now these life forms were each competing with each other for oxygen and nutrients. And of course, they were then competitively very much starting to eat each other. And of course, once you were eating each other, then you had the evolution of sight so they could see what they were doing. They were eating, they were hunting, they were defending each other, forming harder body structures to defend themselves with. And of course, we see that in the fossil record, the Cambrian fossils, the trilobites, here and now all these initial animal life that was all basically living, surviving competitively. Okay, so the whole evolution of life was based from these microbial origins. And of course, we are just in that process. If we now go back 420 million years ago, there's this very competitive, harsh environment in the oceans, very much competitively eating each other, hunting for nutrients. And of course, basically, there was a competitive advantage. And so some smart organisms said, hey, I want to get away from this. And if I can grow out onto the land, those rocky surfaces that had been created by the bugs, but if I can grow out onto the land, then I can go and solubilize and get nutrients away from this competition. And so basically 420 million years, you had exactly the same processes, membrane tubes or tubes of membrane growing from the marine edges onto the land to solubilize nutrients. And these, of course, are fungi. So it was the fungi that were growing onto the land to solubilize their nutrients and, of course, get away from that competitive environment or actually outcompete the, the organisms that were confined into the, in the oceans. And the whole point, though, is that these fungi are like us. They're proto-animals. They can't photosynthesize. They can't fix their own energy. So what these fungi did, they sort of said, look, let's form a symbiosis with blue-green algae. And so if the algae and the fungi get together in a symbiotic relationship, then they can both grow onto the land, solubilize nutrients, but also fix carbon, fix sunlight to live independently on the land. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And these fungal algal symbionts, we call lichens, they're still all around us at the moment, colonizing, solubilizing the landscape. And so we'll see these lichens, these symbionts of fungi and algae growing all over the rocks, concrete, timber, everywhere, actually doing that pedogenesis processes, initiating life. Because as these lichens basically solubilize that rock to get the nutrients, they would colonize it, move on after eight, five, 10, eight days because they'd use those nutrients, but leave behind their cell walls. And their cell walls were made out of glucosamine, which is a chemical compound, but that glucosamine left behind created the first organic matter. And so we had the first soils and it's that glucosamine, that organic matter, detritus that was left behind that becomes glomalin, which was the first basis of soil carbon that was formed. And again, that had a profound effect because once we now mix mineral detritus and organic detritus, we had soils, but we also had a matrix, a three-dimensional matrix, instead of being a solid compacted material the soil was now able to be more open looser and of course infiltrate and retain rainfall and so basically it's pedogenesis you're you're muted walter if you can hear me no i'm muted 
was was I off was I off all that interval? Uh, we we were, it was pedogenesis, the first uh, glucosamine and the first organic matter and structure with soil. Okay, okay, off. so you got uh, it. good. No, no, thank you. Because ago. I wasn't sure <laughs> that that dropped. Yeah. Okay, and so basically it was that formation of soil pedogenesis, organic matter in the soil that gave us basically the capacity of the Earth's soil carbon sponge to form. But it's really that sponge, which is, again, the next point of agency. So we said initially it was these microbes, but it's in the microbes creating the sponge. And through the sponge, of course, we had, as we said, water infiltration, retention, availability. But also, as we open up that soil, we've Just been able to... One more, sorry to interrupt. Your, your yep. camera is looking 90 degrees. There we go. Oh. You had it. There you go. <laughs> there we are. Right. Sorry. Okay. I didn't realize that that had uh, disrupted. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So basically, it was then the microbes that have created the sponge. And then basically, because of the sponge, we were able to infiltrate, retain, and then make available water. Because of the sponge, we had opened up the matrix in that soil. So those nutrients were available for absorption. And so we were able to enhance the biofertility of that through the sponge. It's through the sponge that we actually created aeration in the soils. So now roots could grow down deeper and the volume of soil that was available to plants increased enormously. And in a sense, it's the whole microbial living system in the soil down under that grew and that enabled that vegetation succession to grow and of course of, on the vegetation we then able to have herbivores evolve eating that vegetation and of course from those herbivores we were able to get of course carnivores and omnivores like us to evolve that were living on those biosystems so the whole successive evolution of life really was based on first of all these initial cells microbial cells but then the sponge and then the biosystem so there's a continual step up in organization complexity but it's all based on these very very simple processes the creation of the sponge and the creation of the hydrology then actually had another profound effect because it's basically the sponge that then allowed water to be available. And that water, of course, was transpired by the plants. <clears throat> and that water then actually created the world's terrestrial climate or the Earth's, Earth's climate, but through these terrestrial hydrological processes. And it's actually this hydrology on the planet that governs 95% of its heat dynamics and its climate. And it's all very much driven by the Earth's terrestrial hydrological processes, very much driven by these plants. And so what we're really saying here, it's this soil microbial ecology that developed the land, the atmosphere, our soils, our plants, and our climate. And, and so really, it's, it's a fundamental building block on how the whole ecosystem functions. And of course, it's that that we have actually now impacted and disturbed, which is, of course, pretty critical. We can say we're in the Anthropocene and we say, yep, OK, we've changed things. But it's this understanding of how we've changed things how evolved natural how things evolved naturally what we've done to them because as we have to regenerate these biosystems it's really coming to the basics of that understanding that gives us a chance agency to actually do the regeneration okay and of course it's there that we've actually had the biggest impact now we humans over the last 10,000 years have had a profound effect on that biosystem. And in a sense, we've done that through agriculture because it's our agriculture that has actually 
now basically oxidized the sponge. You know, we just as the microbial ecology rebuilt the sponge or built the sponge to build the biosystems, it's in our agriculture over the last 10,000 years that we've basically changed these processes, made them much, much more oxidative. And in that way, we've basically burnt off the sponge and we've been moving backwards to mineral rock, backwards to that mineral desert that we started with 420 million years ago at the start of pedogenesis. And of course, agriculture has done that through a whole lot of practices. So we've gone into the forest. Yes, we've had to clear that forest to try and grow food. So we cut the forest, we burn the forest, we're oxidizing the carbon in the forest. We then say, look, here is the soil. We've got to get our, our food plants to grow in it rather than living as hunting gatherers off the natural plants in the forest. We say agriculture, we want to grow our plants artificially. So we basically say, look, we've got to cultivate the soil, but in cultivating the soil, disturbing the soil, again, we're oxygen oxygenating it we're oxidizing the carbon from it we're oxidizing the sponge and of course we're degrading that soil we then use fertilizers again to say look we've got to supply our preferred plants with more nutrients so we're adding fertilizer but again excessive fertilizers is massively oxidative and again degrading that soil microbial ecology and that soil physically. We add biocides to actually protect our plants and again, oxidizing the soils as a consequence. We obviously then also irrigate that soil and again, by creating anaerobic conditions, well, that's not oxidative, but we basically, again, limiting, impeding that microbial ecology. And of course, perhaps one of the most fundamental, we then say, look, we don't want weed plants we don't want competitive plants here so we have vast areas of the landscape bare fallow and of course while it's bare fallow it's not getting the food the carbohydrates from the plants and so it's basically starving those soils and the soil microbes of the carbon the nutrients they need and so we've had basically this oxidative process through agriculture and it's basically taking five to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum out of these soils, of course, putting it into the atmosphere, which is a CO2 symptom that we see. Charles Keeling showed us here's a CO2 growing abnormally from about 1750 AD. And it's that extra CO2 in the air from our degradation of our landscape, 200 years from before our um, exponential use of fossil fuels that has actually increased that CO2 level in the atmosphere. So it's actually our degradation of our soils, our biosystems that has actually caused that CO2 increase in the initial times. Certainly now we're actually adding lots, lots more. We'll come back to that later. But Okay, so this oxidation through agriculture of our landscape has had a profound effect. There's 14 billion hectares of land on this planet. 8 billion hectares was initially primary forests. 6 billion hectares was grasslands and rangelands. And we've turned that land surface fundamentally around where now we have 3.5 billion hectares of forest. We still have about 4 billion hectares of grasslands. We've got 1.5 billion hectares of cropping lands that we continually crop and cultivate. But because of this oxidation, because of this degradation, we've also created 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland. And of course, we're aridifying the climate we're, because of this wasteland. We're, arid, and we're degradating, aridifying these soils. We've lost basically half the carbon from that soil land surface. 
and every year we're basically turning you know turning vast areas back into arid wasteland and desert through these oxidative processes so that's in a sense what we've caused and now the question becomes right what do we do how do we regenerate them and of course by understanding how nature created these processes the role of pedogenesis microbial ecology in building them in the first place the question is can we also use these microbial ecologies to now actively regenerate them and that's a sort of very powerful and very very uh, positive message that we can give because if we go down to these microbial ecology roots that created the biosystems then yes we can we can actually also use them in an accelerated way to regenerate and of course to regenerate we start off with the earth soil carbon sponge it's regenerating the earth soil carbon sponge that is fundamental because that gives us a hydrology and that gives us the water we need if we have the water we can transpire that water and of course we can come back into that hydrological cooling processes that actually drives so much of the planet okay in terms of the climate we're getting solar energy coming in continually from the sun that's we've got a natural greenhouse effect that sort of kept kept that planet 33 degrees centigrade is warmer than it would otherwise be but we had these natural balancing hydrological cooling processes that balanced and regulated the climate we're still getting the same amount of heat in from the sun we've intensified the greenhouse effect so we're trapping more and keeping more heat in the atmosphere we've raised temperatures now from the latest ipcc report 1.1 degrees centigrade we're heading very quickly within a decade probably to 1.5 at that point we're going to have dangerous climate extremes dangerous tipping points but nature basically gives us this tool that no we can actually hydrologically safely naturally cool the planet by restoring these hydrological processes but we can only do that by restoring the earth soil carbon sponge so you know this sponge is fundamental it's our only point of agency we have now to create a safe planet create a safe climate naturally the other thing of course the sponge has done is actually through photosynthesis through plant growth it empowers the whole food system that we depend on basically all the food on this planet is driven by photosynthesis and photosynthesis of course is driven by plants those plants need water and nutrients and those that water and nutrients only comes and is only available through the earth soil carbon sponge so the sponge in providing the basis for plant growth is fundamental in providing our food there's going to be 10 billion of us on this planet by 2050 and basically everybody needs to eat and basically to get enough food for the future we can do it there's no question we can grow enough food but we're going to have to look after our soils the sponge that provides the basis for this plant growth the food production as we talked in the second talk though it's also not just growing the food it's ensuring that that food has a nutritional integrity which goes right back to this first diagram that i showed you here that basically it has the right concentrations of essential nutrients it doesn't have the toxic nutrients and that's all a matter of actually the microbial uptake of those nutrients from the soil across membranes into the plants and of course it all depends again on the sponge so a whole future in a sense is governed by this sponge by this microbial ecology it goes right into 
everything we depend on. Uh, for example, our social stability is totally dependent on have we got enough food from these biosystems to survive. The Arab Spring showed us there were seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. Okay, and we're seeing that again, whether it's Afghanistan or wherever. We're hitting food crises regionally, and it all depends on can we grow enough food from these soils through these plants to feed ourselves. So the sponge is fundamentally essential. Obviously, we're going to have to now very much go back into saying, look, here's a finite planet. How do we regenerate our biosystems? Because it's the bio resources, the water, the timber, the resources from those biosystems, again, that we need to sustain these 10 billion people that we're going to have on the planet. So it's how do we regenerate these biosystems, the biodiversity, the ecological services, their ecological health. So basically everything comes back down to, yeah, the sponge and then these microbial processes that enable it and enable us to regenerate it. So this is very, very critically important. So we've got all these resources in nature. The only thing that we haven't got and that we're running out of is time. In a sense, Nature took 420 million years. Well, that was evolution, so it had a bit longer to do it. But we really say, have to ask the question, right, we've got to regenerate. So what's limiting that? And it's really time because we've got perhaps a decade, 10 years to turn these processes around on this planet. And if we don't do that, we're really now getting signals that things are getting very dangerous. You know, we've got dangerous hydrological climate extremes. We talked about your wildfires in California, your floods in uh, New York. You know, things are happening. Things are getting more extremes, more unpredictable. And that's really critical because, you know, while we might be able to say, hang on, I can avoid that, plants can't avoid that. Plants to grow, our food to grow needs a reliable season. And if it doesn't have that season, even if there's enough water in total, if it's not there at the right time, then that plant can't grow, can't produce the seed crops or the food crops that we're relying on, and we go short of food. So the climate is dangerous extremes. This unseasonality, this variation is disastrous. We've also got now through COVID enormous challenges to say, look, here is nature, here's microbial ecology gone bad, uncontrolled. I mean, COVID is just a common cold virus. All our common cold viruses are COVID viruses. Now we have a common cold virus, COVID-19, which has stepped right outside of its normal control systems and of course is wreaking havoc so what do we have to understand about its ecology so we can again come to balance and live with it rather than saying can we develop vaccine after vaccine after vaccine to try and neutralize and protect us from each strain of the virus as it develops so again how are we actually able to get into preventative health through ecological management of these <clears throat> of these <clears throat> viruses another thing that's happening now this is really serious is actually and we're seeing that with covid it's basically the collapse or the stress on our global supply chains so we've built up very very um, dependent global economy on these globalized supply chains you know, moving resources and foods all over the planet. But of course, with um, crises, with climate extremes, with COVID, that's threatened. But now we're all dependent on these supply chains. And so that whole question of globalized supply chains needs to be reevaluated. Do we need to go much more re into relocalization, that we have much more autonomy? 
much more ability to create and supply our essentials locally or at least regionally so we aren't as dependent we're not as vulnerable because as these extremes climate viruses social stress happen if we're dependent on these globalized supply chains we are vulnerable so this these are the crises that we've got and of course the question is yes we can avoid them we can minimize them but we've got to rebuild regenerate healthy biosystems healthy soils healthy sponges healthy hydrology to do that and really, it's now up to us, you see, at the grassroots community individual level. We've been talking about this now for 50 years. I started as a scientist basically in the early 70s or late 60s. And we had, I remember, the actual Stockholm Earth Summit in 1972. And all these issues were raised then, right? We all those ecological limits, warnings and stress points we're all aware of them for the last 50 years but we haven't done anything about it. we just talk talk kick the can down the road to the point now that we've got perhaps a decade to fix it and the only way we can fix it now is just direct grassroots actions by communities individuals everywhere to basically safely cool the planet hydrologically to rebuild healthy food systems and basically to rebuild social equity, social empowerment, social autonomy to give us the safe future that we need. And all of that is really basic, based on, again, the sponge, rebuilding the earth soil carbon sponge, using this microbial ecology that nature used to create it and saying, Yes, we can do this as well, saying that, yes, we are responsible, but also by looking at the sponge, looking at this microbial ecology, we become responsible. So critically important, and that's so important. Okay, so if it's up to us, if it's down to our grassroots uh, sort of active levels, how do we do this? And of course, it's very, very simple so it's really just going back to pedogenesis and saying in our agriculture can we regenerate that can we accelerate that and it's as simple as a b c in a way right because all we have to do is we have to a maximize the growth of plants maximize agriculture it's what we do so well already right we just got to maximize the growth and the amount of photosynthesis, the drawdown of carbon dioxide, sunshine and water and conversion into carbohydrates, sugars with oxygen as a byproduct. So it's maximizing photosynthesis, growing more green for everywhere we can for as long as we can, longevity of green growth. So that's the key thing, but it's not enough just to fix carbon from the air because what happens as we saw in pedogenesis and the evolution of the planet it's what happens to that molecule every gram of carbon that we fix and right throughout this planet life there's only two things that has been able to happen to every molecule fixed by photosynthesis it can either oxidize back to co2 or it can be turned through microbes into stable soil carbon so it's either oxidized or sequester and so what we've got to do is we've got to minimize that oxidation and reverse that oxidation that we talked about earlier that's happening in our agriculture all the burning cultivation fertilization biocides irrigation bare fallows, all those processes that are burning off that carbon that we fix in photosynthesis and instead rebuild the microbial ecology so that carbon is actually turned into stable soil carbon is turned into the sponge okay 
plants naturally, what we see above the ground is 40% of their biomass, but 60% of the sugars are actually used to grow roots and are exuded from those roots as root exudates. So 60% of the sugars are already going down under into the soil. And so it's actually managing those soil microbes, the fungi that convert those roots into the humates, the symbiotic fungi in the soil that take all those root exudates and basically use them to build these mycorrhizal networks that give us the glomalin. And it's the humates and the glomalin, which is the actual basis of stable soil carbon. It's the basis of the sponge. It's the basis of then hydrology and, of course, that ever, ever more productive soil. Innovative, innovative farmers all over the planet are doing are able to use this ABC process and they're fixing up to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum sustainably continually through these ecological soil carbon farming land regeneration processes and that's again enormously powerful because that 10 tons of carbon is rebuilding the sponge What's actually more strategically important is the dividends that these farmers are getting. Because every gram of carbon they're putting into the soil is giving their soils up to eight grams of extra water in the extra water re infiltration retention capacity of the improved soils that they've created. So you're getting this positive feedback multiplier effect one gram of carbon eight grams of water every gram of carbon they're putting into their soil they're massively building the availability of nutrients you know the availability of microbes to access nutrients to enable the fixation solubilization access uptake and cycling of nutrients and it's those microbial processes that of course govern the biofertility of soils. So every gram of carbon is massively stimulating the biofertility of those soils, their productivity. Every gram of carbon we put into the soil enhances its structure, its physical structure, its aeration. And of course that enormously helps the capacity for roots to proliferate and grow to depth. So instead of being limited to a very narrow, you know, eight inches of soil at the surface, we now have roots, as in your prairies, able to go down to five, 10 meters. So the quantity of soil resources that we have for vegetative growth increases exponentially. So here we are, we've got more water, we've got more nutrients, we've got more soil volumes. And so invariably, we end up with massively increased productivity. But we're getting massively increased productivity through this soil carbon improvement, not because we're adding things, we're just simply, as in nature, rebuilding the sponge, rebuilding the availability of these essential factors. And it's that sponge then that's critically important and this is a real determinant now as we go into extremes because it's that sponge that gives that land system, gives our soils, our food production, the resilience it needs. It's a capacity to buffer extremes, to avoid these extremes, but also to survive these extremes. And so this is so critical. We've already lost 5 billion hectares of terrestrial biosystems on this planet converted it into desert and wasteland because we lost that race and that's happening to the rest of the biosystem but we can turn it around okay through this sponge we can re-green some of those wastelands we can re-green some of those deserts by rehydrating regenerating the sponge so this is really the powerful tools and opportunities we have. 
as I said, an individual farmer in America, you know, the Gabe Browns, the organic farmers, Australia, Europe, everywhere, they're doing 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum. But we can do this globally and we can basically draw down 20 billion tonnes of carbon per year from the air, take CO2, take that CO2 symptom that we've created through land degradation. We can take that symptom and use it as a resource, as a building block through these soil carbon, through these pedogenesis processes to basically rebuild the sponge globally. 20 billion tonnes of carbon, of course, is twice our fossil fuel energy emissions and it would get us into negative net emissions globally. It would give us 10 billion tonnes per annum negative net emissions. So an enormously powerful thing. But the issue isn't just carbon accounting. It isn't just the balance sheet of here's our carbon. The bottom line is it's putting that 20 billion tonnes of carbon a year back into rebuilding our soils into our hydrology, into our cooling, into our biosystems, which is where our future is. Okay, so, so we have these powerful uh, natural tools. We have this imperative. We've got to now say, look, this action has to be with us. You know, us at the grassroots level, farmers, but not just farmers. This goes everywhere. There's going to be 10 billion of us on this planet, 7 billion of us will be living in cities dependent on food. So urban agriculture is going to be critically important because it's the urban agriculture which is actually giving us the opportunity, the empowerment to say we can cycle all those nutrients that we're bringing into cities in, as food instead of letting those nutrients go get wasted in our effluence and pollute our environment and create pandemic disease risks, you know, the choleras and what have you, the eutrophication. We can take all those nutrients in our food, all those nutrients in then our excrement, and we can build biocycles to very efficiently and safely recycle and use them. And so urban agriculture is going to be actually on a critical frontier for the future because there's 7 billion of us living in cities and here are then the urban agricultural ecologies, the composting, the bioconversion and the growing of nutritious food locally, autonomously, not dependent on these supply chains, not dependent on soil degradation. In fact, recreating and regenerating soils. Okay, so these are then really exciting, powerful opportunities that we have. And it's actually interesting now, things are changing. In the last two years, the United Nations and bodies all over the planet are recognizing that, look, business as usual won't go on, can't go on. You know, the protection the externalities, the subsidies in the status quo, while we can band-aid situations, perpetuate them for a short while, it's unsustainable. And it's only actually coming back to regenerating the sponges, the hydrology, the natural farming systems, the urban agriculture systems that give us hope. So Antonio Guterres last year more or less sort of made the call in the UN in November to say, look, we've got to come back to these natural climate solutions. You know, how do we actually understand and engage and use these hydrological processes to safely, naturally cool the planet in time? We're having a forum later on this month in September, the UN Food Summit. And again, it's asking the question, how are these natural farming systems able to actually be enhanced, accelerated, extended to feed humanity? I mean, basically, we've had very pioneering, 
courageous organic agricultural uh, enthusiasts doing this for decades. But now we're getting into the situation we have to do this globally. How do we actually pick up these capabilities? So look, it's it's really quite exciting because here is the enabling opportunity to relocalize, to re-empower communities, to regenerate our biosystems, and through that to secure our safe future. But we only have about 10 years to do it in. So, you know, the time is now. And the key things, the watchwords, the targets all the time is, yes, how do we get to these outcomes? And as we've been talking about the sponge, cooling, food security, the water security we need, our preventative health, rebuilding biosystems to give us the bio resources we need, but then also giving us the social empowerment, social equity, and the social stability that we totally depend on. And so these become then critical targets and objectives, but all of them are achievable through regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge and the microbial ecology that underpins them and created them. So, in this sort of concluding talk, I'm trying to really emphasize the point that, yes, if we go back to our roots, if we go back to both the beginnings of life, that microbial, the microbial processes that enabled evolution to create the biosystems we evolved in, if we can go back and if we can understand that and use them wisely, yes, we can regenerate these same biosystems. We can do that within a 10 years. As we've said, the innovative farmers, the organic agricultural people, they've been showing us for decades. Yes, we can, but now it's a case of how do we expand and accelerate that everywhere. We can be very, very comforted in a way that we can be assured that nature will use exactly these processes to regenerate this planet. And the only question is, Will we help her do it and benefit from that, or we will let her do it after we have made ourselves extinct because of our current status quo? So I'd like to leave it there. Thank you very much. But uh, I'm very, very keen to have a discussion and answer any questions on this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for <laughs> bringing forth how all these things are connected and and uh <laughs> what the opportunities are i think that's one of the things I, i'm so glad we we're able to have you on um to speak about is just how it is entirely plausible for these things to be turned around in short order and it's not just the carbon it is a piece of the puzzle but functionally as you said it's you know it's the water cycle the hydrological cycle which governs 95 percent of the heating um and when you've got soil with living things in it that are then transpiring and making clouds, which provides albedo, then you can functionally cool the earth, but you have to manage the land to have those green things in the first place. So um, yeah, it's a very, very, very important message I hear almost coming from nowhere. <laughs> and so hopefully we've been able to um, help bring it forth here. But uh, thank you for that, you know, historical, historical run through at the beginning. It's great, you know, what? Only 10% of the history of this planet have there been plants on land? <laughs> Has it not been yeah. minor minor no, no. point? 90% of the history of Earth <laughs> had bare rocks. Yeah. And and what's stunning, Dan, is when you go back and you basically then the geologists say, hang on a minute, but all these silicate rocks, how did they form? And of course, then they come back and say, hang on, it was oxygen and it was the microbes, right? Yeah. And so you know, like you just, I mean, his life actually creating the very soil, the rocks we stand on, because it was initially, of course, just a ball of magna, you know, like basically very dense, you know, rock from the Big Bang, not the Big Bang, yeah. sorry, the yeah. supernova. But basically, yeah, we're just living off that microbial scum that floated to the top and then, of course, created the, and so everything is sort of interconnected. 
but it's all i mean this is stunning it's earth it's life and it's a life on earth the microbial life that created but now it's our our tool our friends our symbionts that we can regenerate with yeah beautiful well yeah i don't want to spend too much time here we've got uh, three questions that have come in so far and they're all uh <laughs> they're all all doozies um let me see uh we'll start with bills um c14 c13 c12 and the air is had to match um from those in in carbon and fossil fuels how do you maintain it is mostly degradation of soil rather than emissions as the main co2 increase i am with you on hydrological cycle just wonder about co2 increases in history we've been making deserts for millennia um yeah okay well look i mean co2 throughout history if we take that whole you know 3.8 or 4 billion years it's it's been enormously variable right it started off of course well, initially methane and ammonia, but the methane then with oxygen went into CO2. And so our records, and we don't have, of course, precise measurement, it goes back so far, but yeah, 90% of the atmosphere was then based of CO2. And it went up from, yeah, 900,000 parts per million down to 100 parts per million at the end of the Carboniferous Permian when we had all that vegetation pulling down carbon it got down to about a hundred parts per million uh, and of course then of course what happens the planet works in balances you see because as you draw down carbon by definition you're creating more oxygen through photosynthesis right but when you get oxygen get exceeding about 25 percent of the atmosphere things spontaneously combust okay so you basically have massive wildfires and so we had an extinction event at the end of the carboniferous permium where basically everything burnt and we can see that in the the fossil record right so we yeah. had all this plant biomass drawing down carbon bringing carbon dioxide levels to very low levels but then we had this massive fire event. And of course, of nature then evolved a process to say, hang on, I, I don't want these fires. They're so destructive. So we've got this very beautiful thing. I either have fire or I have fungi. Yeah. And again, it's just exquisite, fire or fungi. Because if I can biodigest that fuel, that carbon, and turn it into the sponge... I don't have the fuel for the fire. And that's exactly what you're facing now in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, right? You've yeah. had a horrendous summer of yeah. wildfires. And the question is simply fire or fungi. Do I use the microbes to take that fuel and turn it into stable soil carbon and hydrology and green productive forests? Or do I leave it there as fuel accumulating, which will guarantee me the wildfire and the desertification of that landscape? And the powerful thing is, thank you for the question, the powerful thing is we, ha we have agency. Yeah. Fire or fungi is our point of agency. That's the, mo the most important point is what can we do about it? And, and then we yeah. can get on to you know now that we know what we can do now we have to figure out you know how we're doing it yeah like, and so the we were you know 280 parts per million in the in the holocene you know most of the time 280 300 but we're now 416 parts per million of co2 and that's a warning sign that's a symptom you know that's telling us something serious and of course co2 is a component of the greenhouse effect no question yeah. It's 4% of the global heat dynamics. But the point is, if we see it as a symptom, as a resource, as an imbalance and a building block, yeah. and then we say, yes, we can manage this. We just simply have to increase green. We yeah. just have to increase the longevity of green to pull it down, to rebalance it, right? So, so this is, again, enormously powerful because now we say, right, we have a symptom. Let's get it back down to 350 or lower. 
and yes, let's do that. Um, again, I've got lots of physics and science and stuff, but look, every year, and this is Charles Keeling, you see, we saw this Charles Keeling graph CO2 going up, but hang on, I might have it here and we can show you on one of these. But every year, CO2 basically, um, uh, here we go. It's like now, uh, I'll turn this around again. Now, tell me, is can you see that? Yep, we got it. Right. So until basically, this down, is down into the right would be better, but yeah. Right. Okay. Are you right now? Yeah, close enough. Good. And so basically, yes, CO2 was going up, but what Charles Keeling said, yes, it was going up. And this is a powerful thing about it. I mean, we all saw it, we all recognize it. But every year we've got emissions going up, especially in our winter, right, when we're emitting more. And then every year we draw down as basically terrestrial biosystems draw it down through photosynthesis. So we had this sawtooth going up. Yeah. Now, if you put numbers to that, every year we have a th 130 billion tons of carbon being emitted. And every year we have 120 billion tons of carbon being drawn down by our residual, the remnant biosystems we've got, right? Yeah. And so there's a, a 10 billion tons a year annual deficit. And of course, of the emissions, 8 billion tons a year are from our fossil fuel use. Okay, and so the there's a two fire. And from transpiration of microbes, right? That, I mean, yeah, so what we're saying- This is, is a really important is point. There's 130 billion tons of carbon going into the atmosphere every year, and eight of them come from burning fossil, fossil fuel. fuel. So that's, that's really, eight. We gotta just stop, stop on that for a second. Yep. Eight out of 130 is coming from fossil fuels. All the whole conversation about climate is about reducing fossil fuel use. Precisely. The vast majority of the CO2 that's cycling in the atmosphere is my, microbial respiration in the first place, right? Yeah, but I'd like to take it one step. We, it's not just 100. We've got 250 billion tons of flux of yeah, dynamic. Exactly. 250 billion. 4% is the fossil fuel. So we're talking about 4% of the problem again, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah. here are all the opportunities. And so if we look at what is our potential to reduce, we can easily, I mean, here's 22 billion tons that we can reduce emissions, whether it's eight from fossil fuels, whether it's cement, it's landfills, it's forest fires, it's grass fires. We have more emissions. We have more emissions from forest fires. We have more emissions from grass fires than we do from fossil fuels. Yeah. Every year we burn 2 billion hectares of grass on this planet at some three tons per hectare. You know, every year we burn 350 million hectares of forest emitting from 20 to 200 tons of carbon, depending on how severe they are. See, so these are far bigger than fossil fuels, but we've just simply sort of said, oh, that's not our problem, that's nature's problem. Well, well, we're on one planet, you see, and the answer is, we are we are in charge of 250 billion tons so we can do 22 billion tons reduction but now we can also do drawdown we can actually draw down easily 25 billion tons so there you are we've got 47 let's be conservative let's only do 20, 20 billion tons yeah but do you understand we can actually go to negative net emissions by 2030 profitably and we haven't even talked about rebuilding the longevity and the area of green. We know we've wasted half this planet in desert and wasteland. So we can expand this 120 just by extending the longevity of green, the area of green. I think that's one of the key pieces that I see is where the biggest bang for the buck is, the biggest opportunity is to, is to be doing that, is to be looking at the landscape, looking at what the limiting factors are from keeping it being green and engaging those practices that will accomplish it everywhere on the planet. I just think that's, I mean, it's such an amazing opportunity for a- And, for and a, every one of these steps, Dan, is, is ultra profitable. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, we can give you case studies after case so, studies. So, this is, so this we got is, another question here from, Walt, from Walter Ludwig. Ludwig. He says, 
if this so if this makes so much sense in parentheses as it does to those of us doing it on the ground what must be done to make the case building a soil carbon sponge is the best way to sequester atmospheric co2 repair water cycles improve plant and human health etc why is this not a slam dunk case to make at cop 26 um right uh, okay so we can see your face again but. okay yeah let's turn it around yep Okay, well, look, Walter, this is important, but I mean, it's getting very, oh, that's obviously political. Charles Keeling gave us this data in 1958. By 1970, you know, it was absolutely confirmed scientifically, etc. So we've had 50 years. And the reason is, why have we just sat there, talk, 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 model scenarios, kick the can down the road? As you said, why aren't we there at COP26? This is a 26 COP, 26 COPs, okay? We were in Paris in 2015, COP21. We came to an agreement, yes, negative net. You know, we've got to get to well, zero net, then negative net. And the answer is we have done nothing. For the last five years, we've just talked and we've completely watered down any concept of standards. So the thing, the sad, sad situation is politics can't solve this because politics, we get the best politicians money can buy and that money is all talking about short-term protection of the status quo. <laughs> they can't afford to change the status quo because they've all got vested interest in the status quo. <laughs> they buy the politicians and depending on whatever the party is, it's all about money and votes. And of course, I never captured. heard it quite that way. We've got the best politicians money can buy. That's a great way of <laughs> saying it. <laughs> okay. And so, so point, and that's, um, but, I mean, it's you've not got a to ask the solution. You. You're saying it's an activist. We have to engage, we have to take responsibility for doing this on the ground in our communities systematically. Totally. Is that what you're saying? Totally. I think that's, that. it's not. Don't bother that's with just... Congress. Don't bother with bills. Don't bother with legislation. <laughs> Look, going to a brick wall and pleading to the brick wall to do something, you can come back next year and do it again, but it's not going to change it. It's a brick wall. It's, it's got its vested interest. And it's only, only now, when we're right at the edge, things are collapsing. What's happening now is the larger corporates, instead of saying, I can buy a politician to protect and subsidize and externalize the status quo, how do these corporates say in their own mind, hang on a minute, my future's at stake, how do I invest in this change? But we can't even rely on those corporates. We've just got to do grassroots, community-based, building resilience, building autonomy, relocalization, re-empowerment, rebuilding, regeneration. See, I think it's grassroots activity all the way. Everybody takes responsibility for what they can do, but I don't think, I mean, if, I'll just say as somebody, you know, who's been deeply skeptical about corporates, et cetera, um, you know, the conversations I'm having with people right now, it sure looks like a lot of those corporates are stepping in in significant measure with serious desires to be negative, carbon negative, et cetera, you know, bringing millions of acres of land from their supply chain to the table. So. I mean, I think, you know, we can say that while well, the fires and the floods and everything else, I mean, yesterday it was New York got flooded out. You know, we had various, you know, countries in Europe and China and, yeah. and, flooded, and you know, whatever, a thousand year floods, all the fires, you know, not just the west of the US, but, but but Siberia and Canada and, you know, there's a whole bunch of places around the planet that are burning, you know, Turkey and yep. Greece. And, yeah, uh, totally. So, you know, one could argue, you know, as it becomes more intense, the, 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 <laughs> you know, the irregularities that more and more attention is being put on it and insurance companies are going to say, look, it's in our interest totally. for all this to be transitioned. So, yeah, I'm just going to say, I, you know, while I'm absolutely in favor of we all do what we can do, I think writing off these other factors, corporates and, and governments, I think they can be powerful tools if we have the social movement to direct them and guide them but but, uh, but we must yes. have social movement to to hold their feet to the fire to have yeah. a, a set of yeah. understandings and, and data so it's not being preferred yeah. but uh, I, I think the point what you we both agree and what we're saying is no we have to lead we have to demonstrate we have to do it and then they have to say hey i can't afford to be on this bus 
I've got to be, I've got to have a ticket on the bus because I've got to go where they're going. As soon I don't as need a ticket out, on the bus. Yeah. I need to buy yeah. the bus, right? <laughs> but it's I'll only when we... I'm running of that bus. <laughs> we'll build <laughs> yeah. it. And then, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Mission accomplished, right? So yeah. there is a bus. But, but they've got to know that the bus is leaving, or you know, like because otherwise they'll just sit on the. Okay, I'm just do running the parking lot here. I don't need to worry about the bus. I'm just making money on the parking lot. <laughs> I think we're on the same page. We've got only got about ten minutes left and a number of questions. So I'm going to try to keep moving moving this. Um, Mark asks, uh, Walter, would you could you address the relevance of extending the sponge above ground in a sense by creating microclimates by growing canopies of perennials? agroforestry, silver pasture, particularly on poorer soils, um, cooling as we build the soil sponge. Yep. Considering the fungal relationship with forests as well. Yep. Okay, look, this is, thank you very much and very important. And, and look, everything in nature contributes significantly. My focus has been on the sponge because that's really um, the starting point. But yes, the photosynthesis occurs then in the canopy, of course, in the sunlight trees, shelter woods, these agroforests are fundamental, basically because you end up with a tenfold leaf area index, right? So you're really basically saying, here's a force multiplier, I can tend 10 times the area of green compared to land surface. So my capacity for these trees, these forests to photosynthesize is expanded enormously. I also, of course, then use those to say, look, I can transpire water through that 10 times area, you know, transpiration cooling effect. But perhaps most significantly, I can provide shelter. And it's the role of those trees in actually creating the biohabitats, the shelter, harvesting moisture from the air. Okay, here's another whole dimension It's exciting. There's 50,000 parts per million of water vapor in the up to in the air, flowing across all the planet continually, all the world's deserts. 50,000 parts per million. Up and, to how many, five, and, how many, and how many parts per million of carbon again? 416 at the moment. At, to 50,000. 50,000, up to 5% by weight water. Yeah. And trees are harvesting that every night, dew, mist, fog. So, you know, think about your Arizona desert. There's a cacti. They're harvesting that water from the air. Salt bushes, you know, like these, these trees, these canopies are actually living, harvesting one to two millimeters per, you know, per square millimeter something of water from that air as condensing surfaces. Now, not everywhere, but you know, like these are the forests. Your sequoia forests that are now burning, they get 70% of their moisture from fog harvesting. Okay. And so the, the role of canopies, both in terms of transpiration and cooling, in shelter, in rebuilding this hydrology, in preventing evaporation, desiccation wind speed at the surface is enormous. And of course, then we're not even starting to talk about the habitat. You know, these are the homes and microenvironments for so much biodiversity. So absolutely agree with you. These restoring these forests, fundamental, powerful, but the answer is they need soil. They need soil water, they need soil nutrients, they need those starting blocks of soil microbial ecology. But yes, those, the force multiplier effect of these forests is fundamental. Uh, I work in forests. I mean, I started there in my work in forests. Yeah, we can do 40 tons carbon per hectare per annum sustainably in these productive forest drawdown systems. That's a... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, but to the broader point about what, why this story is not getting out and how it's all, I mean, it is, it's fairly simple. You need to man, manage the land in such a fashion as for it to be alive. And then once plants are growing, they will facilitate the cooling through the water cycle 
it's not yeah. the only carbon, but it's a process and the reversal of the temperature, et cetera, of hydrological extremes yeah. comes from that water cycle being more balanced um, yeah. much more rapidly than it does through the carbon cycle yeah. being balanced. I, I, I haven't seen anybody put this all together and say it really simply and have a little three minute, you know, animated video that makes us like have this aha, but yeah. Really and of course carbon is fundamental. I mean, as I said, it's, here's a symptom, but yeah. here's the resource for the sponge, right? So, I mean, no, no, carbon is critical because pedogenesis, it was that, that organic detritus in the mineral matrix, right? That carbon that enabled that sponge to start functioning. And we yeah, have to do not, that too. The carbon that's going to get the job done. That's so the, the CO2 the thing is all about carbon, not yeah. the functional effect. So we should look at that 416 parts per million CO2 as a gold mine, right? And we just yeah. haven't worked out how to pan for it yet. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just on this broader topic of carbon and water and, you know, sequestration, et cetera. There's uh, Sharon started with a, a post here uh, right at the beginning. Um, I guess there's an article recently in the Atlantic. Um, uh, Bill read the article. I skimmed it while we while you were speaking. Um, Walt Ludwig has another question here, but it's, um, you know, on this overall question of, of sequestration and can it be sequestered or is it really about the carbon or the labile versus stabile, you know, it's about the sponge. It's not about the carbon per se. It's about its function in the soil. Is that, I mean, can we, is that a fair? Yes, very good. And uh, coming back to Walter's point about labor, look, life nature it's a dynamic it's how much carbon goes in how much carbon goes out so we we tend to be so fixed on hang on is this rock solid forever well no it's a matter of fluxes how much is coming into the system how long does it stay certainly and then how much is used by the system microbes are using that carbon as their energy source right so they are oxidizing it slowly but the question is, it's a rate of sequestration, the rate of respiration and getting that balance. The same with the climate. It's a question of here's a warming uh, effect and here's a cooling effect. And nature balances these warming and cooling processes to create a stable climate. It's, it's really powerful, isn't it? When you think of how does nature control the climate? We just take it as a given but you've got to ask, how does she do it in the process level? And there's sun coming in. And so how does she regulate it? Yes, yeah, she has processes where here's my hydrological cooling. Here's my warming processes and I can balance it. And the Holocene has been 10,000 years of stable, balanced climate because of these balancing dynamics. And so we've got to see things always as this, yeah, balancing dynamics rather than here's something fixed in concrete. Which is what indigenous cultures globally were doing was totally. balancing dynamics as caretakers of the land, whether in Australia or the Americas or wherever you want to look on the planet, they were managing the dynamics of the land to keep things in, you know, yeah. in fundity. So and we look at, hardly look at, have this capacity. Yeah. Yeah, and look at any, I mean, look, here's grazing, for example, right? No grazing, you've got desertification. Overgrazing, you've got desertification. But there's that sweet spot where you say, look, it, this thing is just driving optimum prairies. You know, look, look at your prairie soil. You know, like 9,000 years ago, they were glacial till, waterlogged, right. anaerobic, glacial till. In 9,000 years, the prairies, the bison, the grasses, your you know, tall grass prairies created the world's most productive soils, 8, 10% carbon to 10 meters deep through a balance. Herbivore, grass, sunshine, herbivores, microbes. 10% carbon, 30 feet deep. Yeah. 30 foot deep soils at 10%, is that 10% organic matter? Well, it varies. Yes, of course. And at the yeah, surface, it's yeah. more than down below. But the point is that you've had yeah. 10 meter deep rooting systems yeah. with, yeah, up to 10% carbon, right? And it's just, I mean, I just, and that all in the space of 9,000 years. 
you can go better than that. You take our friends, the Dutch, you see, and they'll take stinky, saline, toxic slime from the bottom of the Rhine River, you know, all the waste from Europe and yeah. Germany and Switzerland. They'll take that stinky slime and within 10 years of accelerated pedogenesis, organic thing, they're growing tulips and now they're Europe's largest agricultural exporter. <laughs> they're the world's second highest value in agricultural exports because they're you know, right up there using that substrate through pedogenesis to be productive. Yeah. Within Not 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> the opportunities are everywhere. It's just a question of being far enough down the rabbit holes to be able to understand them. And then more, you know, once you've got to that point, then how do you have the lever, levers to affect that kind of systemic engagement, I think is really the crux of it. You know, what is the process by which people can engage in this kind of action? You know, if you've got a, a, a quarter acre house lot, you may be able to do something if it is, it's presumably not bare, bare ground. So, you know, what are the deeper strategies for, for engagement? Um, you know, I'm not sure there's a great well, answer. Well, look, I mean, yeah, yeah. And that, this is where the urban agriculture comes in. But what I'm saying is, as we agreed, it's, it's stimulating and demonstrating these are the buses off the, you know, they're leaving. Yeah. Uh, look, at the moment, what we've always gone back and sort of said, look, Yes, we've lobbied or whatever, and and the vested interest, I mean, is just so strong. You've got such a protected, subsidized. I mean, you're in the US, you've got a farm bill that's a, a trillion dollars thereabouts a year, protecting the subsidy and subsidizing the status quo. 90 cents in the dollar of it goes to the big corporates to, yes, yeah, subsidize and protect the status quo. So you've got a, a trillion dollar sort of impediment blocking change. Yeah. Now, no, I mean, it's a good thing that the government wants to stimulate, but that money, if it was invested in catalyzing innovation and regenerative change, you could turn America around in, in 10 years, no troubles. No trouble. Yeah. Well, and the rest of the planet as well. Um, and, and that goes everywhere. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the most exciting things is <clears throat> what we're doing in India now, um, basically a big movement with natural farming, right, from Andhra exactly. Pradesh, but it's taken all over India. But now the prospects of saying, look, here, <clears throat> here we've got 5 billion hectares of wasted uh, desert and wasteland. Can we take 1 billion hectares of that wasteland and with some of these very... Um, ecologically effective regreening strategies can we actually regreen one billion hectares of arid wasteland and yeah. turn it back into a yeah into basically a a rangeland green rangeland with cooling processes but also providing grazing and food production capacity and yeah. so that prospect is there and of course it's extremely exciting but also profitable and beneficial i think people who don't know about zbnf or whatever the acronyms are zero budget natural farming or right. yeah natural farming yeah yeah, yeah. Z, i mean look it up it's a very a very inspiring story and walter and dd and the have been very active yeah and the inspiring that. thing about it dan is the thing is literally there's eight hundred thousand poor women farmers that are driving this thing yeah. So this is all on one acre little plots. Legit. And these are grassroots self-help totally. group, women's yeah. self-help groups that said, look, this is my children's food for tonight. We're going to go gardening and we're going to do this. So it's basically 800,000 catalytic grassroots empowering drivers. That's just getting started. It's just in one state. Right? Oh, yeah. It's starting to spread. Yeah. But this is... This is grassroots, what you're, what you're talking about. This is people on the land, not necessarily Americans in their suburbs or in their cities, but but smallholders, you know, you know, <laughs> subsistence farmers. Yeah, well, look, it's a, <clears throat> another whole big uh, discussion, yeah. but but it's really, uh, no, no, a lot of these don't actually have land. They're just basically, you know, doing this and as leases working. or they're, yeah. you know, working. 
but they're really just working and it's really a community saying, okay, our future depends on this. And of course, what's happened now that this has now been adopted right across India by the Modi government yeah. to say, no, we're going to do be, go beyond the green revolution, beyond the green revolution with science to do this regeneration. Here's our food strategy, here's our health strategy, is our climate strategy all through this grassroots natural farming revolution. I think that's a great place to end this conversation. We're a couple minutes over, but a great, a great um, you know, vision or, or <laughs> something we can look to as far as people on the ground really actually changing the weather, um, Im improving, improving the climate um, through yes. climate action. So. Yep, yep, they're there. Well, look, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Walter, for all of your presentations this year at the conference. Um, everything we can do to help get your understandings out further, I'm I'm committed to. It's it's a very important piece of the puzzle, which you're uh, <laughs> one of few who's 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 leading. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and it's been <laughs> very big pleasure of mine. And any time, happy to help. Okay. Great. All the best. <laughs> Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.